I, I, uh, one of the things that strikes me about this poem is that it's actually formally accomplished and very politically sophisticated. Uh, formally, it, it does what every poem needs to do. It needs to give the reader pleasure. You need to be able to, as Edward Hirsch says, fall in love with a poem. And she enables us to fall in love with this poem by the sounds. Mm -hmm. The S's are lush. And it's alliteration. It, it relates to the sea, uh, the sea context. Um, you can hear the sea shore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the first challenge of a poet. You need to, that's the enganche, the hook. You get the, the reader in love with the sounds and with your, your, your wordplay, uh, and everything else follows. It's interesting how this poem uh, is so innocently, it, it seems innocent, and yet it's got this political message underneath it. Uh, I asked her about this poem and she said that she wrote it thinking about her peers who were overly concerned with their professional careers. Uh, this was 1975, so she was uh, directing the Chicano Studies program at Seguin. Mm -hmm. So she was very satisfied with her own position at the time. But the people around her were really concerned about making money and you know, and so she was equating them in some ways with the conquistadores. Yeah. Wow. And uh, it's an interesting political message, especially given the time and the end of the Vietnam War. I uh, w began to think, what is the name of the fourth ship? Yeah. We're given the name names of the three other ships, and I kind of decided that the name of the ship was Wanderlust. Mm -hmm. I think it's really about uh, uh, our searching, uh, our looking at things that normally we don't look for. I was also uh, uh, given the idea that exploration in a different form than the exploration of the other three ships. Uh, the American writer Tennessee Williams in his play Camino Real says, make voyages, attempt them, there's nothing else. And I got that same message from this uh, poem. Yeah, she says she's vowed to her voyage, not to her destination, not to reaching someplace or conquering some place or reaching some goal, but to the voyage itself. There's, uh, you know, that whole quest motif actually speaks to the politics that you've mentioned, um, but also has a metaphysical resonance. Um, it, it reminds me in, in some ways to, to Lorna de Cervantes' poem, uh, Refugee Ship. Uh, and there's a, a line in that poem that, that um, says, uh, I'm on the ship that will never dock. And it has that existential quality where the voyage is, is, is itself the end. Um, and it's particularly important uh, given the time in which it was written. You, know, you mentioned the 70s. This is before the, the consolidation of what we call post-colonial studies, which is a critique of these type of colonial voyages. Yeah. And it offers a very complex uh, 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 anticipation uh, of, of the critique, and also it gets b way beyond that critique by resisting the, the diatribe and, and the overtly political uh, polemics. And it takes a step back and it starts to meditate on what happened after the colonial contact, which, as we know, uh, involved a lot of other subaltern subjects, Jewish, Muslim, mixed race, uh, African, uh, gypsy uh, sailors who were pressed into service or who joined because that was the best option. And that enabled an, a, a very complex interplay of, of subaltern subjectivities that we now know of in, in terms of borderlands uh, subjects. So that's, she's introducing that. Years be before. <laughs> yeah, before Anzaldúa, before post-colonial studies. And that is actually quite an accomplishment. Yeah, that subaltern notion of a, a, an alternative space or an alternative reality, uh, and she's opting for that. It's as if she's redefining uh, the point of these voyages. I mean, the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria were headed west to find land to make a conquest, and she's just like, 
it's all about the voyage. It's about creativity. It's about discovery without conquest. It's about yeah. this intellectual pursuit as opposed yeah. to it. I uh, went back to the first page of Moby Dick, another <laughs> famous voyage, and uh, one of the first lines that uh, Ishmael tells us is that when he got world weary and tired of, of the hum and drum of the city, he would sign up on a ship yeah. and try to give himself this freedom to think, to be creative, to let the world go by and and just uh, wander. That's and what I Alex like Haley. That. Alex Haley used to do that, and in fact, he's in the photograph in uh, this book. In this book, yes. Uh, he would. He was a merchant marine. That's how he wrote Roots on mm -hmm. the merchant ship. Yeah. And you know that is a particularly important message. Also, uh, the voyage and being behind the crowd, because when you stop and think. Uh, this involved a certain amount of bravery. Uh, this fourth ship, uh, which, has, which is a persona in and of itself, uh, offers us a really important message about going along the road less traveled, uh, right, as Frost has, has, has proposed to us. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly important for American audiences of, of all backgrounds because, you know, this is and has been for some time you know, the world's uh, strongest nation, uh, militarily and more or less economically, that can get dangerous sometimes because it leads um, it leads us many different directions. And it's important for for not just youth, but for elders and everyone in between to read this and say, you know, um, I'm going to take that chance. Uh, I'm not the first one to do that, and it, and it's important that I'm part of that other group. It's an interesting notion, especially given the time, because these ships were assigned a goal, and this ship is AWOL. <laughs> this yeah. ship is, is resisting. This ship is, you know... Lost at sea, is it? Is by choice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was struck by the idea of the words in each stanza, the first words in each stanza, and I'd like to read them. Behind, lost, following, breathing, sailing, rolling, playfully, eternally, forever. Yeah. And I just was stunned by the idea that the whole poem is in those uh, nine words. There. Yeah, it's a poem by itself. Yes. <laughs> you know, it, it, it speaks to her craft. She spent time on this, uh, or maybe she's one of these geniuses who compose a piece and it's just ready. Um, she could very well be that. She's quite prolific. I think she but, spent time on this one. But it, it looks like <laughs> this is a poem that was deliberate, it was crafted, it involved a lot of complex thinking. It's, it's, it's like a piece of sculpture where you just start with a big piece of granite and you sculpt it down to the, to, to the thinnest piece of beauty uh, that you can possibly give. It's pared down to its minimalist uh, possibilities and that's why it resonates, because it invites a lot of different readings, and it's still very much grounded. I'd like to return to that uh, notion of innocence and or seeming innocence. This remind you brought up Frost. This reminds me of when Frost was told that his poem "Spring Pools" was a drop of strychnine, and he said he didn't know that. <laughs> he thought it was an innocent poem, you know, but it had this this message underneath it. Uh, this poem was particularly important for Carmen because it, it was the first one to appear in a standardized textbook. In 1984, Scott Forsman brought it out as a high school textbook, or in a high school textbook, and suddenly she was there with Carl Sandburg and Robert Frost, and, and she felt wow. like, wow, I have arrived. And so this was a poem that marked that point in her career, and here it is about diverging. <laughs> and, and you know, I think it's worthy of that crowd. I think this particular poem is worthy of that crowd, mm -hmm. and it shows that she's worthy of that crowd. Yeah. She might be above a few of them, too. It's, it's yeah. one of her most anthologized as well, so it's, uh, it's, it's got an audience. <laughs>